Yeah, what in the world? Dirty. Hi, everyone. Well, good morning to each one. Welcome to Abbots Creek Missionary Baptist Church. Those of you that are here in the sanctuary, as well as those that are joining us on Facebook Live, we appreciate you being with us so very much. If you're a guest with us today, we want to especially welcome you to our service and encourage you to fill out a connection card. If you're here in the sanctuary, those are available in the pew in front of you. And if you would fill that card out and drop it in the offering plate on your way out, out in the vestibule, that would be greatly appreciated. Or you can uh, scan over with your phone the QR code that is there in the bulletin, and uh, that will take you to an online location where you can fill that uh, connection card out right there online, and we encourage you to do that. But thank you so much for being with us this morning. I want to remind you of just of a couple of announcements. Of course, encourage you to uh, look in your bulletin. Those are available in many different locations, and I hope you have... Uh, uh, got yourself a bulletin. Just a reminder that the church office will be closed uh, tomorrow in observance of Memorial Day, so make note of that. Uh, of course, want to encourage you to join us on Wednesday evening at 6.30, both online and in the fellowship hall as Pastor Steve continues our study through the book of James. I know that would be an encouragement to you, so I encourage you to join us for that on Wednesday at, at 6.30. And then I have an announcement for all parents of students that are going to Caswell. If that applies to you, immediately following our worship service this morning, if you could just meet me real quick right down front, and I want to get some uh, paperwork into your hands. And uh, so if you could, parents of students going to Caswell, uh, please, right after our service this morning, right down front here so I can get you uh, some uh, information to fill out. Well, once again, thank you for being with us this morning. Appreciate that so very much. We trust that you've come to worship our Lord in spirit and in truth. And as we continue in our worship, Andrew is coming to lead us. Good morning. We're so glad to see you here this morning. I invite you to stand with us as we lift our voices, singing praises, glorifying our God together.
Father God, we are grateful to you on this day because it is through Jesus Christ's death and resurrection and the hope that we have in him and the blessings we have through him that we can sing this morning, it is well with our soul. Father God, it's our prayer that in this place that would be true of each one. Lord, no doubt there are many who are burdened and struggling, waging battles that are secret in their hearts that they don't want anyone else to know about. And maybe their souls are anything but well this morning. They need to hear from you. And so, Father God, it's our prayer that you would speak through your word this morning to hearts and to lives. And that your perfect will will be accomplished as Pastor Steve preaches that which you've laid upon his heart, that which he's prepared and studied, and that our ears would be ears that are willing to hear and a mind that is open and receptive as your spirit takes the word of God and drives it deep that it would bear much fruit. And so, Lord, if there is one or more here this morning who does not know Jesus as their Savior, would you today draw them to yourself, convict them of their sin, and save them? For Christians here this morning who are battling and struggling, maybe today they need to reconnect with you. There needs to be a revival in hearts and lives. Would that begin? Would that happen with that start here today at Abbots Creek Missionary Baptist Church and the lives of those present in this building and the lives of those watching online that you might do a mighty work in our midst and you do every time we gather together every time your word is proclaimed every time we lift our voices in song to you Father God you do something and we praise you for that and so today we ask for that And we ask that in all things you be honored and glorified. Forgive us for where we have failed you. Cleanse us. Renew us. We thank you, Lord, for this day and this time at this moment. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've been singing this song, Glory to God, forever, all month, all this month of May. So I encourage you to turn to the screens as you'll watch this video from the writer of the song. Yeah, this song, Glory to God, forever, has been um, a really amazing journey to kind of watch the song unfold and come to be. The idea is this. It's a really simple song, but it's based on a massive concept, a massive thought. The, the simplicity is that there's not a lot of words, it's not complicated, it just says glory to God forever, that's the whole chorus. Um, the massive um, thought is that everything in our lives, every moment, give glory to God. That strikes at the very core of why we're made, of why God created us, is that we would give Him glory. The thing I love about the song is that it actually asks of God a, a huge thing. It says, God, take my life and let it be all for you. And that's totally contrary to our culture. Our culture says, take my life and let it be about me. Um, let, let it be about my fame and my purpose and getting as much as I can get for myself. The song, this, this whole idea, this confession says, God, take my life that you gave me and let it be for you. Let it be for your glory, for your grandness, for your fame. Let it be for mercy and justice and worship and grace. Let my life matter and count in the story of God, in the story of history, and for the kingdom of God. That's why I love the song. I believe I believe like this is a song that is already in us to say God created us to give glory to himself and I think that's why um, a lot of times when people walk away from um, our concert or listening to our CD that's the song that they're kind of like humming and singing and carrying with them is glory to God glory to God forever I feel like sometimes I didn't even write it because we just started singing it one night uh, we just started singing Glory to God Forever. I mean, the song, the, col- the whole chorus in its full form, we just started singing it out um, as if we already knew it, which says to me the song was already in me to sing to God. It was almost like God was like, hey, I got, got a new song for you, Steve. I just wrote it. It's about myself. You're going to like it. Would you please sing it? 
uh, we just started singing glory to God forever and looked around at each other going wow this is this feels like what the people of God should sing uh, right now to the Lord about um, our lives uh, that we want to give him all the glory and all the praise we sing glory to God glory to God glory to God forever about today so um, let's stand and sing this song together today <laughs>
God forever. Amen. Y'all sound lovely this morning. Let's be seated. If you would go ahead and turn in your Bibles this morning to the book of Luke. Uh, and today we're going to be in chapter 12, 35 through 40. Luke 12, 35 through 40. On this Memorial Day weekend, we certainly want to remember all of those who have died in battle throughout the years. We were hearing in the Baptist men's breakfast this morning about uh, the connection to the Revolutionary War here in our own area and the connections to our church and thinking about uh, even back to those days. Uh, and how our freedom that we have today began even way back then. And uh, so we're thankful and want to remember all of those who laid their life down uh, to give us our freedom. And with that in mind, the greatest one to lay his life down to give us freedom is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to turn now to God's Word and think about what Jesus has done for us and how his coming should affect our lives. Luke chapter 12, 35 through 40. Well, one of my, I'll just say my favorite television show of all time is the Andy Griffith Show. And uh, my wife will tell you that if they're in black and white, I pretty much can quote just about every line before it ever happens. And uh, one of my favorite episodes was an episode where Aunt B went away for a little while. She was debating about going. She was worried about leaving Andy and Opie by themselves. She knew it would be a complete disaster. And uh, so she goes away, and she's even going out the door. She's still like, no, I shouldn't go. No, I shouldn't go. It's going to be horrible. But she goes on. She goes to visit. She's supposed to be gone for a pretty good while, several days. And needless to say, Andy and Opie did exactly what she thought they would do to the house. I mean, it was destroyed. It was a complete wreck. There were newspapers laying all over the den floor and the cushions to the couch were in the floor and in the kitchen there were plates everywhere burnt toast sticking out of the toaster and burnt eggs in the frying pan dishes stacked up on the counters dishes stacked up in the sink dirty and nasty and up in Opie's room he had a half-eaten apple that was laying there on his bed and clothes strewn everywhere just a complete wreck about midway through the week, Andy and Opie are kind of looking around the room and they're thinking to themselves, you know, we got to do something about this. If Aunt B saw this like it is right now, she would have a fit. We need to clean this mess up. And then they looked at each other and they looked at the room and they looked at each other again and they said, no, we've got plenty of time. She doesn't come back till later in the week, so we'll just leave it be until closer to the time when she gets here. Well, then a phone call later, Aunt B decided to come home early. And Andy and Opie are scrambling around the room and around the house, cleaning up dishes, trying to, uh, Opie stuffed the half-eaten apple up under his pillow and made his bed. I mean, they were just going crazy last minute because Aunt B is coming back sooner than they expected. A lot of people in our world today are living their lives as if they've got plenty of time before Jesus comes back. A lot of people thinking that, you know, I'll just wait until it gets closer to time and, and then I'll get ready for Jesus to come back. I'll just kind of live my life and enjoy it and do whatever I please right now, but I've got all this time left. I'm young, I've got years left before I need to do anything about Christ. And so they just live any way they choose. And I want you to think about this as we go into this passage of Scripture this morning. What would Jesus find in your life if He came back now? Now, I'm not talking about sitting here in a, in a worship service on Sunday morning or there in your home watching a worship service online. I'm talking about everyday life. What would He find? What would He find if He came back this afternoon? at 3 o'clock? What would he find if he came back tomorrow, next week? What would he find if you were out on a date? What would he find if you were at work? What would he find in your everyday life? This is for us to consider this morning as we go to this passage. If you're able to stand with me 
to read from God's Word, Luke chapter 12, 35 through 40. We're reminded that all Scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And so we read from God's Word. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. You can be seated. Last week we looked at the passage right before this one about worry and talked about fear of the future as we kind of continue this week thinking about the future and the coming of Jesus and we'll continue that same line of thought next week uh, when we pick it up in verse 41, kind of a three-week series on this. But as we look at this particular passage today, the main idea I want you to take away is simply this, be ready for the coming of the Lord. Be ready for the coming of the Lord. He ended the passage, the verses we read with, Therefore you also be ready. Be ready. And so that's what we want to focus on. But as we do that, what are some things that you and I can do to be ready for Jesus coming? The first is this today. And that is this. Be focused on the work of the Lord. While we wait on Him to come, be focused on the work of the Lord. We look in verse 35 and the Bible tells us, Jesus said these words, let your waist be girded. Now, how many of you use language like that every day? How many of you got up this week and said, I'm going to get up today and I'm going to, wait, I'm going to gird my waist. Uh, you might have thought about something else related to your waist. I'm going to diet or something like that. But gird your waist. What in the world does that mean? The thing that we have to do when we study the Word of God, we have to first study it in the context of its original audience and original setting. What would it have meant to them in that day when Jesus said these words, let your waist be girded? So let's talk about that for just a moment. Back in that day, they wore a long robe that was called a tunic. And that tunic would hang down all the way to the ankles. Even the men, guys, listen, the men had to wear tunics. These robes that hung down to their ankles. Then they wore something called a girdle belt. Not what you would visualize today, but a, a girdle belt, a leather belt that went around the waist and it went around the center there of that tunic. And then what would happen is that held it tight, but then when they had something to do, when they had something important to do, when they needed to work, when they needed to focus on a task, they took that and they pulled that tunic up and they tucked it down into that girdle belt. And that was called girding up the waist. Okay, So they took that and tucked it down. But it was symbolic in that day uh, of being prepared. It was symbolic of having something to focus on and do. So if the men had to run for some reason, they pulled that up and they tucked it in. If they were doing some physical work that required that tunic to be out of the way, they would pull that up and they would gird that down into that belt. Again, the idea that I've got something to focus on and so I'm girding up my waist. And so here in our text, this is a command given to us here. This is something for us to do. We are to let our waist be girded. We are to be focused on something specific. And I would say to you that the thing that God wants us to focus on is carrying out the work that He's called us to do until the time that Jesus comes back. Focus on the work of the Lord. Now, 
I got a magnifying glass up here, and when I was a little kid, and I, I know that some of you did the exact same thing, when I was a little kid, I don't remember who showed me how to do it, but you'd go outside, and you'd put this in the sun, and what would happen? The sun would shine through that magnifying glass, and what could you do to a leaf? Set it on fire. Now, some of you right now are saying, Pastor, we, we burned ants, not leaves. I don't want to know that. But we, we would burn leaves back in that day. We would set that thing down there and put it on there. And if you held it on that leaf long enough, that sun, that powerful, big, huge sun, with all that energy and all that heat, what would happen is, is that that beam would come down, it would hit this magnifying glass, and it would focus it into one little small area. It's burning my hand right now from those lights. It would focus the, the beam down into one small area, put all that heat down into one little tiny spot, and that leaf would get hot, and if you left it there, focused on that leaf long enough, all that light focused on that long enough, it would set the leaf on fire. And I'm here to tell you today that if Christians around the world would stop focusing on thousands of things and more focus on the work that God has called us to do, we could set this world on fire for Jesus today. If we would get focused on what He's asked us to do, well, what are some of the things that we are told to do? And what is this work? Are we really supposed to work for the Lord? Listen to John and chapter 9. And verse 4, John chapter 9, and verse 4. Here's what Jesus said. I must work the works of Him who sent me. Now, who sent Jesus? The Father, right? I must work the works of Him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no man could work. Jesus said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So what we get from this verse is Jesus says, hey, right now it's day and I can work. Nighttime's coming when i got to stop. In other words, while I'm on this earth, it's day. It's time to work and I'm going to do the work that God sent me to do. Because the day is coming when I won't be able to work anymore. That's the point that Jesus is making here. And so Jesus was sent by the Father and His attitude was, while there's time, I'm going to do what God, my Father, sent me down here to do. You say, well, that was Jesus. Well, John chapter 20 and verse 21, Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send who? You. Now you say, well, that was the 12 disciples. No, if you read the end of the book of uh, Matthew, if you read the end of the book of Mark, the end of the book of Luke, the end of the book of John, the, end of the beginning of the book of Acts, you will see that all believers in Christ are sent. We are sent to do the work that God has called us to do. And while it is still day, we must do the work that God our Father has called us to do. Focus on what God has has called us to do. Well, what is that work? While there are lots of things in Scripture, one of the primary passages that teaches us what we're to do as the body of Christ is Matthew 28, 19, and 20, where it says, Go ye therefore unto all nations, and what are we to do? Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have commanded. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. God has called us to go and make disciples. What is a disciple? It is a lifelong learner of Jesus Christ. How do you become a disciple? Call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior Lord. You become a disciple. And then you are a lifelong learner who's learning from others everything that Christ commanded you. And then in turn, turning and teaching others what Christ has commanded us. This is the role of every believer. A few weeks back, we looked at Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 11 and 12. And there the Bible says this, God has called some to be pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the what? For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. God has called all of us to do our part, to do our share, to build up the body of Jesus Christ. And how do we do that? By doing the work of the ministry that God has called us to do. Can you imagine if every believer in Christ were to focus on the work of Christ, what could happen? 
Could you imagine if we were all witnessing? Could you imagine if we were all telling people what Christ commanded? Could you imagine if we were all ministering to each other and loving on each other and bearing each other's burdens? What if every believer in the church everywhere was doing the work of Christ? Do you not believe we could set the world on fire for Jesus? This is what God has called us to do. And so we focus on these things that he's called us to. Go back over to Luke chapter 12 again. And there's a second truth that I want you to see. Not only be focused on the work of the Lord, but be faithful as a witness for the Lord. Be faithful as a witness for the Lord. You say, wait a minute, Pastor. You just said be a witness, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. You already told us to do that. What are you talking about here? So here I'm talking about something just slightly different, so follow along with me here. In verse 35, after he says, let your waist be girded, the next thing that he tells us to do, a command is, is let your lamps be what? Be burning. Now, in that day, uh, these were oil lamps that they had, that they lit, and oftentimes they did this. He talks about here in a minute a wedding Oftentimes they did that at a wedding, but at other times they had their lamps lit and, and you had to go and you had to refresh the wicks of the lamps and keep those lamps burning all the time. So what is this idea of keeping your lamps burning for us as a Christian? We don't have lamps, so to speak, that we're to keep burning. This does symbolize all, the part of being prepared, ready at all times. It definitely symbolizes that. But I believe also that God is teaching us here that, that there's something that you and I should have burning all the time. There's something that, in a way that our lamps should be burning all the time. And I believe that's spiritual. So listen to me and, and listen with me and go over to passage, a passage in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Now remember when we read a minute ago about Jesus said, I must do the works of Him who called me? While it is day, the night is coming when no man could work. He said the next verse, and I read it, he said, as long as I am in the world, I am the what? I'm the light of the world. As long as I am what? In the world, I am the light of the world. Where is Jesus now? He's in us, but where is He physically right now? He's at the right hand of God the Father. He ascended into heaven. He sent His Spirit down here to be with us, but He ascended into heaven. Right now, according to this verse, you and I as believers in Christ are the what? Are the light of the world. As long as Jesus was down here walking among men, He was the light of the world. He's gone up to heaven and now He is the light of the world, but through you who are the light of the world. So every believer is the light of the world. What are we supposed to do with that? Verse 14 says... A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. In other words, don't do what? Don't hide your light. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. And here's what he commands us in verse 16. Let your light so shine before men. How shine? Not hidden. Not over here on the lampstand and, and covered up where it can't be seen. Listen, there is no such thing as secret Christianity. That I, I just, you know, I'm a believer, but I don't show my faith. There's no such thing as that. We're a light. We're not supposed to hide our light. We're not supposed to be embarrassed about being a believer in Jesus Christ. We're not supposed to not want anybody else to know that we're a Christian. Okay? We're to let our light so shine. So it says, let it shine before whom? Before men. Why? And this is where I get this idea of also being a witness. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. There are two ways in which we witness. Listen, every single believer in Christ is called to share verbally the good news of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. That, that's what we're to do. To evangelize is to pronounce and announce the good news of Jesus Christ. We're all called to verbalize that. 
But we're also called to live our life in such a way that others will see us and see how we live and glorify our God in heaven. So here I'm talking about being a witness in the sense of your life being a living testimony of who Jesus is in your life. That, that others look at you and they go, something's different about that guy. Something's different about that lady. I, I look at them and I see Jesus. I look at them and I see somebody who's kind. I see somebody who loves everybody. I see somebody who's living out the Word of God. That's what I see. So let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now when I was a little kid, I loved catching lightning bugs. And living out on the farm in Davidson County, we had lightning bugs everywhere in the side yard. We'd go out in the side yard, used to get a jar. How many of you got a jar? Cut little holes in the lid, old mason jars, you know. And then you go catch lightning bugs. My daughter and I, my son did too, but my daughter loved to catch lightning bugs when she was a little girl. And Stephanie and I would go out in the side yard and we'd see all the lightning bugs and we had our jar over there and We'd run over and she'd say, there's one, Daddy. And we'd run over to get it. And I'd reach out and just as I'm about to grab a hold of the lightning bug, what happened? His light went off. And then you're like down on your knees, you know. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You got to get down below the tree line so you can see the lightning bug up above the tree line. And when he goes down below the tree line, you can't see him. And she's like, Daddy, I can't see him. Where'd he go? I don't know, honey. And then his light would light up. And she'd run over. There he is, Daddy. And we'd run over. And just as I'm about to grab him, what happened again? The light went off. See, light, catching lightning bugs is fun. But what's hard about catching lightning bugs is the light doesn't stay on all the time. And we need to have our lights on for Jesus all the time. We need to be Motel 6 Christians and leave the light on. Some of you will have to Google that. <laughs> All the time, letting our light so shine before men. Keep your lamps burning. That's what God's called us to do. So can you imagine if we were to focus on the work of the Lord and then live our lives in such a way that others are constantly seeing Jesus in us and people are like, I want what he's got. I want what she's got. I, I'll tell you this. A buddy of mine and I played basketball at the Thomasville YMCA for over 28 years at lunchtime with a group of men. And one day, a guy came up to us. I, I, don't, I didn't even at the time really know his name. And he came up to Brother Mike and I, and he said, Can I go to lunch with y'all? I said, Sure. Went to lunch, went down to Tommy's Barbecue to have lunch together. And here's what this guy told us. He said, I've been watching y'all for the last eight years on the ball court. And there's something about y'all that's different than everybody else. And I want what you've got. And Brother Mike, who was my pastor at the time, led him to the Lord in Tommy's Barbecue. And the only thing was is that he saw something in us that was different. Now, I'm not saying that to toot my own horn. There are plenty of times my wife will tell you where I don't look much like Jesus. Okay, But what if we all strive to be like Jesus on a regular basis, to let our light shine in such a way that others see it, and then they want what we have? Uh, how awesome would that be? Go back over to Luke again. So not only be focused on the work of the Lord, not only be faithful as a witness for the Lord, but number three, be found watching for the Lord. Be found watching for the Lord. Verse 36, he says, And you yourselves be like men. Now let me just stop right there for a minute. There are three commands in this passage, in, through the verses we're looking at this morning. Let your waist be girded, let your lamps be burning, and you yourselves be like men. Okay? That's the three commands. What kind of men are we supposed to be like? You yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he return from the wedding. And when he comes and knocks, they're ready to open immediately for him. They're ready for the wedding. Now in that day, at a wedding, the bridegroom would, would go away and then come, come back to the bride's house 
and get the bride and take her to the wedding in that way. And this is what it's describing here. When he will return from the wedding, the, when he comes and knocks, they're ready to open immediately. This is a bride ready to open immediately. You say, Pastor, I, I don't want to be a bride. I want to be a bridegroom. I, I'm a man. Let me tell you, when it comes to spiritual, you and I are the bride. Men. Not the bridegroom. The bridegroom is Jesus, and we're the bride, the church. Okay? So are we ready, church, when Jesus comes back, our bridegroom, to take us home, and He knocks on the door? That's not how He'll do it, but if He did, are we ready for Him to come? That's what it's asking us. It says, blessed are those servants, verse 37, whom the Master, when He comes, will find watching. Be found watching. Assuredly, I say to you, he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. And I believe this is a picture of Jesus serving us one day at the Lamb's Supper, at the, the Supper of the Lamb, uh, when we meet with him and dine with him. And it should, if it should come, listen to this, if it should come in the second watch or come in the third watch or different watches in Jewish culture, no matter what time of day he came. Look at it. Blessed are those servants. What servants? The ones that are found what? Watching. Ready to open immediately. Verse 39. But know this. If the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. So there we have this analogy of, of a person who's coming to break into a house. If somebody called you up and said, hey, I'm coming to rob you tonight. I don't know about you, but I would have my dog off the chain and sitting at the front door and probably have a loaded gun sitting there waiting. I don't know. Or call the law and have them come. But we'd be ready, wouldn't we? He says, if you'd known, you would have been ready. You wouldn't have let your house be broken into Therefore, since you don't know when he's going to come, since you don't know when a thief is going to come to your house, and therefore you're not ready, since you don't know, you've got to be ready all the time. That's his point there. And since you and I don't know when Jesus is coming back, verse 40, therefore you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not what? You do not expect. We don't know when he's coming so we have to be ready all the time now when I was at pilot elementary school I can remember like it was yesterday seems like yesterday I can remember like it was yesterday fifth grade particularly the fifth grade I don't know why that stands out to me but I can remember sitting in the classroom and the teacher saying I'll be back in about 15 minutes I've got to go to the office Y'all, did y'all ever have a teacher leave the room temporarily? Back then, they did that. She'd leave the office, head down the hall. You know what happened immediately when the teacher left the room. Now, back in our day, it wasn't pulling out a cell phone or playing games on a cell phone. It was making a paper football and flicking them on the desk. Y'all know what I'm talking about? It was taking three pennies and playing penny hockey. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Put your little goal post up there on the table and you played penny hockey. It was people shooting spit wads at each other across the room in a straw. And, and people up out of their seat running all over the room and we put a watch at the door. <laughs> and they'd stand over at the door and they'd look out the door to see if she was coming. Chaos in the classroom. And then the watch would say, here she comes. And everybody darts back to their seat, gets in the seat, puts away the footballs, puts away the pennies, puts away the spitballs. Everybody sits in their seat. They're quiet as a mouse. She comes walking in and everybody's sitting there like this. You know what I figured out later as I got older? That teacher knew exactly what was going on. But we thought we could just do whatever we wanted to do as long as she was away. And then when she came back, we'd start doing right. The reality of it is that God knows what we're doing all the time anyway. But we don't want to be like Opie and Andy and wait till the last minute thinking Jesus will delay coming back like Aunt B did. 
We don't want to be like the classroom waiting till the teacher's coming down the hall because we don't know when they're coming. We don't know when Jesus is coming. And so we live our lives now, every day, watching, watching for His return. That idea of watching literally means like a person up on their tiptoes looking and waiting in anticipation, prepared for Him to come. In this passage, he talks about being like the man who when the Master comes and knocks on the door, he's ready to open it. I thought about that quite a bit. That, that verb, that, oh, excuse me, that sentence in that verse. And I know Jesus is not going to come and knock on our doors, per se. That's not how He's going to show up. But for the sake of analogy here, what if that was the way Jesus came? What if when Jesus came back, He came knocking at your door? What would He find? Would He find us watching Ready to open immediately? Or could it be something like this? Who is it? It's Jesus. Jesus! You're here! Jesus, you're here. And they run into the other room. And they start scrambling around like Aunt B is visiting Opie and Andy. They start scrambling around the household. Oh no, Jesus is at the door. And they run into the bedroom and they grab a couple of magazines off the, off the counter there next to the bedroom, off the nightstand, and they hide them under the bed. Just a minute, Jesus, just a minute, I'll be right there. I'm coming, Jesus. And they run into another room and they run into the spare den where the spare television is, the room that nobody ever watches TV in. And they go in there and they find the DVDs underneath and they're like, ooh, that one's okay, that one's okay. Ooh, ooh, let me hide that one. And this one's okay and this one's okay. And then they run back into the den and, and there's the computer sitting open, screen on. And they go over there and they're clicking on there. And they're clicking and clicking and they're clicking and getting rid of this site and this site and this site and this site. And meanwhile, Jesus is at the door knocking. And then finally, after getting everything put away that we thought would offend Jesus, we went to the door and opened the door said, hey, Jesus, it's good to see you. My daddy told me when I was a young boy something that I'll never forget. He said, son, everything you do in life, ask yourself this question. What if Jesus came back right now? How would you feel? Would you be embarrassed or would you feel good about it? A great lesson to live by. Will we be found watching, watching, ready when he comes back? First and foremost, the only way to truly be ready is to know him as your Lord and your Savior. And there may be somebody in this room, somebody watching online today that you would say, Pastor, I don't know what would happen to me if Jesus came back today. And I want to ask you this simple question, if that's you. If He came back today, would He take you to heaven to be with Him? Do you know that? And let me go a step further. Let's say He doesn't come back today. If you died today, because we don't know when that will happen either. Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you go to be with Jesus? The only way to be ready is not to be in church. That's a good thing, but it's not, it's not how you're ready. It's not even to have your life being lived in a way that's pretty clean and maybe there aren't some embarrassing things you've got to stuff away at your house. The only way to be ready is that you have put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and He is your Savior and Lord. 
Are you ready? Are you ready? And then believers, for all of us, what will He find us doing? Are we focused on the work of the Lord? Are we being faithful as a witness for the Lord? Will He find us watching, ready to open immediately when He comes? Will you pray with me? As we enter into a time of invitation, a spirit of prayer, if there's someone here in the room you've never called on Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior, you don't know that if you died today you'd go to heaven. You don't know if He came back that He'd take you home to be with Him. But you want that. Pastor Josh and I will be down front in just a second. Here's what I want you to do. When we stand to sing, just come down and just tell us, I want to pray to receive Christ. And we'll walk you through what's next. If you're watching online today or in future days, and that's you, I want you to reach out to us. You can pray right where you are at any time and ask Christ to be your Savior and Lord, but call us and talk to us and let us walk you through what's next for that. Let us walk you through how to make that a public profession of faith. You reach out to us. But all across the viewing audience today, most of us have trusted Christ as Savior and Lord, but how are we living our lives? What's the main thing that we're focused on? It's not that we can't have hobbies and other things that we do, but what's the main thing? In the end, this life is so short, and what really matters is eternal things. Are we focused on the work of the Lord? Is your light shining all the time? Are there some times in your life where it's not shining? Are there some places where you're going that you're not letting people see the light of Jesus? Maybe out of fear, peer pressure? Let your light shine. And then for all of us, is there anything in our lives that we're doing that if Jesus showed up, we would be embarrassed because we know it wouldn't please Him? And if it is, confess it and let Him forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness right now. Father in heaven, God, move in the hearts of all your people listening in this moment and listening in the days ahead speak and Holy Spirit bring change to our lives and if there's someone who doesn't know Jesus I pray right now Holy Spirit that you would bring them to you convict them of their sin and their need for Jesus thank you for loving us Jesus thank you for dying on the cross for our sins that we might have eternal life help us all to be ready we pray this in Jesus name Standing as we sing, you come as God is speaking to you this morning.
Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, God, thank you so much, Lord, for your word. Lord, I pray that as you have promised us in your word,